We will now turn our attention to the concept of viscosity. You probably already have an intuitive understanding of viscosity. Viscosity, as we described in a previous video, is the resistance to shear. Or you could think of it as a fluid's resistance to actually flowing. A crude way to describe this is that the viscosity is a measure of the fluidity of a fluid. For example, honey is a lot less fluid than water. Viscosity also aids in describing the frictional force exerted by moving fluid particles on its neighbors. Okay, so consider this schematic over here, where we have a moving plate, it's being pulled in this direction. And we have here a fixed wall. We'll show later in our study of fluid mechanics that the velocity profile for the fluid between the moving plate and the fixed wall is given by V is equal to Vy, so it's a function of Y, the velocity of the fluid. It's equal to the velocity of the plate multiplied by your position y divided by delta being the distance between the moving plate and the fixed wall. Examining this motion, we would find that the fluid in contact with the upper plates moves at the plate velocity vp. That is, the velocity at this point on the fluid is actually vp, which is the same as the plate velocity. Furthermore, the velocity of the fluid at this point, which is in contact with the fixed wall that is not moving, it's equal to the velocity of the wall, which is zero. The observation that fluid particles at solid surfaces move with those surfaces that means that it sticks to the surface, so to speak, is known as the no-slip condition. So we call this the no-slip condition. And this is a very important concept. Okay, so due to the action of viscosity, the velocity of the fluid in contact with a solid surface will move at the velocity of that surface. That is, there is no relative particle motion at that particular layer of the fluid and between that particular layer and the, um, the solid surface. This is such an important result and it applies to both liquids and gases. So given that we have this velocity profile here, so that is the velocity is not uniform, each layer of fluid moves relative to layers above and below it. That is, there is a relative motion between, let's say, this layer of fluid here and this layer of fluid here and this layer of fluid here. Since there is a relative motion between, um, between layers of fluids, we will have friction between uh, adjacent layers. So if we consider this fluid element here and we zoom in on it, what do we have? This fluid element experiences a shear stress due to the viscosity between the layers of the fluid. So the shear stress is given by the variable tau. So the fluid layer above the, this fluid element exerts a shear stress of tau up here, and the fluid layer below exerts a shear stress tau over here. The shear stress tau is defined as a shear force divided by an area. For this fluid element, we can also state that V1 is equal to 
v of y, and v2 is equal to v at y plus some delta y. Okay, so we would say that we have a delta y over here. As we'll see later in the, in the course, the shear stress is directly proportional to the velocity gradient. So we could say that the shear stress tau is proportional to the velocity gradient, v2 minus v1, divided by delta y. And for a Newton, uh, what we would call a Newtonian fluid, this constant of proportionality between the shear stress and the velocity gradient is the viscosity. So the constant of proportionality, mu, is mu, the viscosity. V2 minus V1 divided by delta Y. So we call this the viscosity. And this term over here is the velocity gradient. That is the change in the velocity with a change in height. More generally, what we could say is that tau is equal to mu multiplied by the limit as delta y goes to zero. So we get, we're considering smaller and smaller uh, elements of fluids of v y plus delta y minus v at position y divided by delta y. And what we see here is this, this, this limit is simply just the derivative. So this just becomes tau is equal to our viscosity multiplied by dv by dy. And this is an important result. So the shear stress at a given layer of fluid is equal to the viscosity multiplied by the velocity gradient at that point. Now this is a simplistic example um, so for different flows, your velocity gradient is not necessarily linear. You could have a parabolic. You could have even a sep uh, you know, something that looks quite wonky. Um, so uh, that's why the shear stress is usually defined at a given point. This viscosity mu is called the dynamic viscosity. And it's a material properly, property highly dependent on the temperature. So we could say that the viscosity is a function of the temperature. Fluids for which the shear stress is linearly proportional to the velocity gradient, as we've seen here, are called Newtonian fluids. So most common fluids for engineering applications, which include both liquids and gases, can be treated as Newtonian fluids. Okay, so a fluid for which the shear stress is linearly proportional to the velocity gradient is a Newtonian fluid. And this is what we will exclusively deal with uh, in, the, in our study of fluid mechanics. Next, we look at the classification of fluid flows. There is a wide variety of fluid flow phenomena, and it is convenient for analysis to be able to classify them on the basis of some common characteristics. In this video, we're just going to show uh, three modes of classification, which we've touched upon in a previous video. These categories are by no means exhaustive. So the first one is the distinction between a viscous 
and inviscid flow. So by inviscid flow, we mean non-viscous flow. So we're going to start with the following statement. There exists no fluid with zero viscosity. Okay, so even though we we are saying that there is a certain classification of flows that we call inviscid flow or non-viscous flow. This is an approximation, but not a representation of the true reality of the fluid. However, in many flows, there are regions, typically these regions are far away from, so from solid surfaces, where the viscous forces are negligibly small. And these are called inviscid flow regions. Okay, so uh, we could say uh, regions here where viscous forces are small. On the other hand, regions where frictional effects are significant are called viscous flows. So this would be for inviscid. And for viscous flows, um, these are flows where we have high viscosity, for example, or um, regions uh, that uh, where frictional effects are very important. So regions with um, large frictional effects. The next categorization is um, compressible versus incompressible flow. The variation of density during flow determines whether the flow is compressible or incompressible. So let's write this down. Um, so dependent, compressibility is dependent on the variation in the density rho. Just to be clear, I'll just write here density. A flow is deemed incompressible if the density remains nearly constant throughout. So incompressible if rho is approximately constant and the converse applies to the compressible case. So rho is not a constant. For example, a pressure of 210 atmospheres is required to change the density of liquid water by 1%. So for 1% change in the density of water. That is a huge amount of pressure that is required to induce a very small change in density. On the other hand, a pressure change of only one hundredth of an atmosphere is required to cause a 1% density change of atmospheric air. So that is 0 0.01 atmosphere. And why don't we write these as deltas, so a pressure change of only one hundredth of an atmosphere is required for a 1% change in the density of atmospheric air. Thus, most liquids, such as water, are generally treated as incompressible, and gases are treated as compressible. There is a quantity that is often used to, to help determine whether a gas flow is compressible. This quantity is called the Mach number. <laughs>
The Mach number is defined as the ratio of the velocity of the fluid divided by the speed of sound. The speed of sound is equal to 346 meters per second, and this is at room temperature and sea level for air. So a flow is supersonic if the Mach number is greater than 1. A rule of, th of thumb for gas flows is that they can be approximated as incompressible if the Mach number is less than 1. So, even though we've said that relatively small changes in pressure induce, uh, quite readily induce uh, changes in density in gases, a rule of thumb, as stated here, is that um, if the Mach number is less than 0.3, we can treat a gas as incompressible. The final ca uh, classification of flows that we will consider in this video is laminar versus turbulent flow. A highly ordered flow, such as that of a highly viscous oil at low velocity, is termed laminar. So we could say that a laminar flow is highly ordered and the term comes from the observation that adjacent layers of the fluid move together in laminar motion. Okay, so uh, adjacent layers move together. Okay, so we could have a fluid, as we saw, we had a velocity profile like this, and they are all moving in the same direction in an orderly fashion. Okay, so yes, even though this layer might move um, at a higher velocity than this layer, they are all moving in the same direction and in an orderly fashion. Conversely, a highly disordered flow, characterized by pronounced velocity fluctuations, is called turbulent. So this is a somewhat qualitative description, but highly disordered. Large velocity fluctuations. We could also say that um, there are strong rotational components. That's another way to describe it qualitatively. So strong rotational components. And we call these eddies. Now turbulent flow is a very involved um, a study of fluid mechanics. But in fact, turbulence is widely observed every day from wakes behind boats or airplanes to the plume of a cigarette. In fact, most flows in nature and engineering are actually turbulent. So here are a few visualizations of the concepts we just introduced. So let's consider this image over here. This is a visualization of uh, the fluid flow or the velocity profile of a plate inserted into a fluid stream. So you have a plate at the center line here, which is inserted. So imagine you have a uniform flow entering like this. And then we insert a plate right in the middle over here. Due to the no slip condition, you can see that there is 
a velocity deficit, so to speak. So the velocity or the fluid wants to stick to the plate at this point. So this is the no-slip condition. But far away from the plate, so in this region over here, we see that the velocity is relatively constant. So what we can say is that we have an inviscid flow region over here and a viscous flow region over here. So indeed, even in the inviscid flow region, viscosity is still present. However, the viscous flow uh, the viscous effects are negligible compared to the inertial effects, whereas near the plate, that is not the case. Near the plate, the viscous effects uh, overwhelm uh, all other effects. In this image over here, we have an F-18 fighter jet flying in the supersonic regime. So what we see here is an example of the compressibility of a gas. So at high Mach number flows, what we uh, see in, uh, in this regime are shock waves and uh, expansion waves, compression waves, things like that. And these are characterized by abrupt changes in density, pressure, and temperature. Finally, the third image here, what we have is um, a submarine. And this is a ni nice example and a juxtaposition of laminar and turbulent flow. So we see here upstream, the flow is fairly laminar. It is ordered. Layers seem to be moving together. Whereas in the wake over here, we see that it is chaotic, disordered, We could say it is rotational. And so this region here, we would say that it is turbulent. And this is laminar. So these are all concepts that we will explore further in our study of fluid mechanics.